Uh, very good question. Uh, the biggest problem with the penal system at the moment is um, two things. One is sentence creep, which I'll come back to, and the other is the fact that there are just too many people in prison. Um, there are 86,000 people in prison in England and Wales at the moment, England, Wales and Scotland at the moment. Um, I believe that figure should really be around 45 to 50,000. And uh, the, the, the main issue is sentence creep. So if I stalked you 10 years ago, I would go to prison for about 12 months. If I stalked you five years ago, I'd go to prison for about three years. If I stalked you today, I'd go to prison for 10 years. So for the same offence, the sentence creep has gone up a huge amount. One of the other problems is around knife crime in, in inner city gangs, because if, I'm, if I go out with you in Durham tonight, and you have a knife, and I'm, I don't have a knife, but you have a knife, and you go out and stab someone, and I'm with you, I'll go to jail for virtually just as long as you will. So there are loads of people going to jail for much longer sentences. And the problem is, if I'm in jail for um, seven years, um, what's the difference between me being in jail between six, either six or seven years? It's not really gonna make any difference. I'm just in jail for longer, which is a bigger cost. So the other part of that is the problem with sex offenders, because there are lots of people who are now in prison who, are, um, who committed sex offenses many years ago. And lots of people would, would say, quite rightly, they go to prison for a long time. Um, but the problem is a lot of these people are elderly, a lot of them have um, medical needs, dementia. There are people in prison today who wake up every morning and they have no idea what the name is and they have no idea that they're in prison. The oldest person in prison in the UK at the moment is 104 years old. So we've got this prison population that's in there for a lot longer. And on the other side, we've got this churn at the bottom where people are in, in prison for six or seven weeks. So if you, if you, have, if you, if you are sent to prison for six weeks, you lose your job, you may lose your home. Um, if you have kids, the kids may get taken into care. And that is for six, seven weeks. That could be not even paying your council tax um, or your phone bill. So either end of the scale, it is a problem. But that also comes down to money. Because if you put loads more money into the system, when people are in prison, you could look after them better and give them more opportunities to um, improve their past behaviour. Um, if, if we were, imagine um, all of us were locked up today. Imagine we all went to Durham Court and we were all locked up for 10 years. And we all have to live in this room, and these are our cells just through there, and we're all here together for 10 years. And we're all put together, the, you and I, we're, we're, in, we're in a cell together, you're in a cell together, you're in a cell together, for 23 hours a day, where we have a, basically an open toilet, we have a little telly, and that is it. And when we're released, we're expected to be perfectly functioning, employable um, citizens of the country. It just doesn't work. So it's a combination of there are too many people in prison and for those people who are in prison, there's not enough money and time um, devoted to them to help them. Okay. My cellmate. <laughs> um, I've actually got three questions, but I'll stick with one okay. um, to start and try not to talk it. Um, so first question is, um, if you could just dig a bit more into the what you're talking about, about organisational change and cultural change, particularly in a really big organisation. Um, I'd just be really interested to hear about how you went along with that and what you learned from that and how you, how you managed that. Okay, so I like to think I'm in some ways a bit of an expert on this because we've bought eight businesses since I've been running the, running the company. And for, all, for every company that we've bought, I've had to change that culture to be one. Because we can't have an organisation with lots of different cultures. We only have one culture, which is the Timpson upside down management structure. And what I find when you take on different organisations, there will be some fantastic people there, but also there will be people who don't get your culture and never will get your culture. And that's where the problem is, because it's not about systems, it's not about processes. A culture is simply about people. And what you have to do is to understand it takes time. It's about communication and about being very, very clear of what good looks like and what personality traits work well with your culture. Um, so, for example, we bought Johnson's Cleaners 15 months ago. Um, soon, as soon as we buy any business, the turnover goes down. Don't know why, whenever we do it, the turnover goes down. Um, so it's down though, but we, 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 we always end up getting there in the end. And it's our job to work out who every individual is, whether we think they fit our culture, and the ones that we think do fit our culture, pushing them and developing them. Um, but I've also learned with organisational change that you need to spend money 
you can't expect an organisation to change unless you significantly invest in it, because um, that is the way that people will believe you. If you. You can go to lots of meetings and say we're going to do all these things and say how wonderful it's going to be, but until you spend money investing in things that are going to um, improve the way the business operates, they won't believe you. Um, you know, we haven't always been successful. We bought a business that we manufactured house signs and letter boxes for sale to B&Q at home base. And it wasn't our business, it, we're sort of shops. Uh, we had two pubs, is it, do any of you go on holiday to Anglesey? Do you go to Anglesey? Um, the, we had two pubs there, and again, it wasn't our thing. We tried, we tried to implement our culture in there, but it didn't work. Um, probably because it involved alcohol, and people <laughs> behave differently when it comes to alcohol. But if, if I went in to run one of my friends' very successful businesses and tried to implement my culture, it may not be the right thing for that business because they've been successful on one culture. So the key for organisational change for me is to ensure you get to a point where there's just one culture. So you've got to bring them to your culture um, and not dilute yours. It's very difficult. I mean, I think the statistics are that um, the majority of mergers fail, and it's about culture. Okay. Uh, Toby, <coughs> Toby Simmons, Van Miller College. Uh, two questions. Do you have any statistics showing that your, uh, your colleagues who used to be in prisons are more productive? And second question, uh, people who score higher in the personality trait of disagreeableness tend to actually earn more money. Does that go against your theory of kindness and how do you interpret that? Okay, so the first question, so on statistics on prison, on pr on prison leaders. Statistics around prisons are generally very difficult to be exact on, but what I can tell you is the people who recruit from prison stay with us longer, um, they're more honest, and the reoffending rate is around about 3%, where it would be about 48%. So there are only, we can talk about reoffending anyway, rate, that could be on remand, just you know, being caught with some weed or something like that. We've recruited over 1,200 people from prison, and we know of only four that have gone back to prison because they've committed a further offence. So statistically, it, it is convincing. But don't forget, we are being selective. So I'm not going to prison saying, right, you lot, ten of you, you're coming here. We are very selective when we're in there. Um, so we're, we're recruiting the... Um, cream the crop. And sorry, your second question? The second question was that people who tend to score higher in the personality trait of disagreeableness actually tend to earn more money. So does that conflict with your idea of kindness? Yeah, so but one is I would challenge that, because they may earn more money, but in shorter spurts. So what they, I mean, and I, and I see this quite a lot, um, you'll get, I get CVs through all the time of people who are job hoppers, and they're on big money, and they go from job to job, they may be quite successful in the short term, but then they're either paid off uh, and they keep moving around. So I, I would challenge that. I think there are some organisations where there's just a very aggressive culture. Do you remember the Phones For You shops? Do you remember Phones For You? Very aggressive business, all about sales, 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 and the whole business was focused on it. I know a number of people who used to work there because it's quite near where we live. It ruined people. Even now you can tell, it's sort of a standard joke in our sort of business community in the Northwest. You can tell someone who's worked for Phones for You because they've been ruined, because they've worked them so hard, they've, they've paid them loads of money, they were devoted to the business, but it ruined them. So I also think it's naive to think that a, a pay package and a salary is reflective of how able someone is, because I don't think it is. I think you know, if, if you were to look, someone who's good at selling themselves is generally overpaid, because they're good at selling themselves. A so salesman are traditionally overpaid. It doesn't matter what, what business you're in. Um, but uh, for me, my most successful, brightest, uh, most dynamic colleagues um, are not paid footballers wages. Um, and they're happy. So I just be careful of that link between success and Okay, good question. So the reason why I went with employ someone who's a sex offender is for a number of reasons. One is that we are taking photos, we do photo ID in all of our shops. And the idea of a sex offender taking photos of children, I think is totally unacceptable. The other is my colleagues are very happy to work with someone who's an armed robber, 
a murderer or you know has been in a fight and you know is a you know was a gang was a gang leader very happy to work with them and in fact our customers are quite happy to be served by them but they're not happy to work with someone who's a sex offender and this comes back to the real problem with sex offenders is they are generally very manipulative people um, I've spent quite a lot of time in prisons talking to sex offenders walking on the you know, walking around the sex offender wings, and I do not feel comfortable. I do not feel that they are the kind of people who will give kindness and be really good at working with a team, because they are, I would say, 95% of them are very manipulative people. It's a real problem, because they're unemployable. Now that's why a lot of them either lie on their application forms, or they end up being self-employed, so they drive taxis or whatever. And just two final questions. Then. Um, so the sort of culture that you're describing, kind of very customer centric, putting your frontline employees first, and um, putting your customers first, sounds very sort of reminiscent of um, perhaps an idealistic vision of the past of these great British businesses, and um, going back to sort of Hadley's and all, mm -hmm. and John Lewis that you mentioned. Um, do you do you think there's been a, a change away from that culture over time, and can you attribute it to anything? Do you think it's an Americanization? Do you think it's to do with the growth of business schools, anything like that. So that's the um, first question. And the second question, just more generally, just looking at your business and um, looking ahead to over the next five, 10, 15 years, I mean, what do you think the big challenges are for you? Are they sort of political? Is it sort of related to these sort of things? Is it technological? Is it um, automation? Or is it sort of skills, education, or things like that? So just um, two questions from you. Okay, so um, I think the reason why companies don't really want to often embrace our culture, our kind of culture, which I'd agree that, I'd sort of, in some ways I'd say lots of companies are starting to do it our way, um, is because when a business is in trouble or an organisation is in trouble, the finance function takes control. And finance people are generally more systems and control based. They don't really like making decisions based on emotion. And if you look at all these businesses at the moment that are in trouble, Certainly retail businesses, um, it, it's run by the accountants. And that is why, in, in my view, lots of businesses stray away from it. I do think business schools have a, um, a contribute, are a contributing factor to it. And I also feel that um, technology, we haven't, really, we haven't really mastered how technology can give amazing customer service, personalised amazing customer service. So it's very process driven. Um, but if, if you were to look at some of the, um, amazing, there are some amazing technology businesses that I would say run the business in a very, very similar way to us. You can walk in and they would, have you heard of Zappos? Just like Zappos, um, Chewy and a few other ones. They run the business in a very similar way, although they're doing a very different thing. But to answer your second question, the real problem is do you, what would you say your, your second question exactly? Yeah, I want to get it right. second question, just generally, when, when you're thinking about your business five, 10, 15 years down the road, what, what do you yeah. see as the sort of big challenges? Okay, it's technology. It's all about technology. The, if, you were, um, if you were to speak to a history graduate, um, <laughs> and they were looking back, they were here in 200 years' time, 100 years' time, they'd look back on the history since the Second World War. It's about technology. It's about the speed that technology has changed our world. And the problem with it, like an old-fashioned retail business um, and retail generally, it hasn't kept up because it just moves so fast it's been impossible to keep up. So if you look at um, the amount of business done on the internet, I mean the UK is sort of the, the leading um, economy on buying online. But if you look at your bank statements, how often it says Amazon on there now? Whereas you know, when I was at university, we didn't have email. When I was here, there was no email. So it's changed so fast a lot of businesses have not kept up. But also the difference of that is people are spending money now on very different things than they were five, 10 years ago. And that will change even more in the, future, in the next 10 years. So people still like indulging themselves. People like going out to restaurants, like going on holiday. They like treating themselves to things. But people spend a disproportionate amount of their money now on technology um, and on the, the products you can buy around technology than traditional ways of spending money. And that is going to continue. I also think that in the Western economies, are, we, have a, we have an aging population, and if your generation are going to have to work incredibly hard to pay for me. 
and people a bit older than me. And the problem we have in this country is that if you look at Japan as an example, Japan's productivity cannot improve because older people are not as productive as younger people. And as the country gets older, it's going to be harder to develop the economy. And, um, you know, talk about Brexit and all these different things, but for me, the two big issues are we've got an ageing population and technology. And it's going to be really hard. Yes. Um, why do you think most businesses are reluctant to employ extenders? Um, I meet lots of business leaders and they say, oh, it's really interesting what you do, we, sh we should probably do that. And then they ask their <laughs> HR director to get in touch with me and they bury it because they think it's hard work and they worry about the reputation. And yeah, there are certain businesses where they're not allowed to recruit people from prison, you know, banking and lawyers and so on and so on. But it doesn't mean that they can't employ um, a cleaner or somebody who works in a canteen or a van driver who's been to prison. The reason why people don't do it is, in my, in my view, they're scared of it, uh, they've got prejudices against people who've committed crime, um, and it's too much like hard work. Uh, and that is why they, did, that's why they don't do it. But what they don't realise is they're actually probably employing loads of ex-offenders anyway. So, so we say we're the biggest employer of ex-offenders in the country. That's not true. Tesco will be. The NHS will be. Asda will be. It'll be full of people who've committed lots of crimes. The, the, you know, in, in your careers, you will work alongside people who have criminal convictions, but you just don't know. And it doesn't mean you treat them any differently. Um, but there are more and more companies employing people from prison, and for me, Brexit has been the reason for that. Because if you are a business based down in the South East, it's really hard to employ people at the moment. Um, so you are going further and further down the food chain and prison is becoming more attractive. Especially if you are in the construction industry. You know, I've had in the last month two big building companies phone me up to say, we want to start recruiting people from prison, we need more bricklayers, we need more scaffolders. Um, so I actually think, ironically, although I was against it, I think Brexit has been the best thing for recruiting people from prison. Um, George Jackson University College, I want to stand up because there's not many of us here. Um, do you think in the long term, we will, long term unfortunately, right? not, not necessarily within the next 10 years, but after that, we'll see um, a revival of the high street, if you like, in terms of with the internet is, is, is adding an interesting dynamic to the way we shop. Because you know, 10 years ago, you had retail parks springing up everywhere. Now, nobody wants to go trudging around retail park on a, on a Saturday, you know, it's, and a lot of the, the, the big stores are, are struggling, you know, like the department stores and so forth. The internet is taking a lot, over a lot of that business, but still, people will want to go to shops, they'll want the personal um, service, they'll want the experience of going around a nice high street like Durham. Um, and your shop is, is quite sort of, um, I read your father's, is it your father's article in the, in the Telegraph? Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he normally writes that. And you pride yourself in being quite sort of old-fashioned service in that, in that sort of respect. And are you, um, are you primed to take advantage of that? Um, because I think that, that sort of that service-based um, shopping is, is coming back. Okay, so I'm going to answer that in, in two ways. So at the, in, at the internet moment, it's growing like this. It won't grow like that forever because it's impossible to grow like that forever. So we'll get to a point, maybe it's in 30 years' time or 40 years' time, when it levels out, when you've got an online business and then an old-fashioned retail business. And the, the whole retail business will be much smaller. Fortunately for us, in our business, we're a bit like dentists, where you can't, you can't go to the dentist on the internet, can you? You can't get your hair cut on the internet. In fact, we just opened up our first barber shop. So there will always be things that you can't do on the internet. But there'll be other things that you can purchase on the internet and on the high street, and the differentiation is who can give the best service and value. And there will, this is retail's opportunity to really up its level of service. But at the same time, the online players are doing an incredible job of personalising the, the service that they give. So what will happen with high streets? A lot of them will go and deserve to go. And if, if I look at the sales of our shops, somewhere like Durham will always be fine in Durham, but it's the suburbs of the big cities that's the problem. London's fine, London's on fire. But if you look at the suburbs of uh, Leeds, of Manchester, of Sheffield, that is where all retailers are struggling because of online and also these big new retail parks. So the traditional big retail parks have been um, changed now to these just in-town retail parks, uh, where they'll have a TK Maxx and they'll have lots of food and beverage offers. But for me, the real issue for government is parking is ridiculously expensive in town centres, which means that people don't go. And then what are they gonna do 
when these high streets reduce in size. So they're going to have to spend a huge amount of public money restoring these areas, not to be shops, but to be housing, to be community facilities and so on. So I see a lot of high streets shrinking. I think the specialisation of service is important. You know, people will, you can't go out to a restaurant on the internet. You know, people want that experience of being social, of, of interacting with people. And you know, you'll always have nice places like Durham and Cambridge and all these different towns that will be well. Um, but a lot of them will have to specialise, and they'll have to specialise in local, personal service, because you cannot buy eggs from the local farm on the internet. Um, and you see these specialist retailers popping up more and more now. Um, and there are some high streets that are absolutely thriving with independence. And the more independents are there, the more the, the community want to support them. But that is only in more affluent areas. Uh, Daniel Hoverbolsky, College of St. Hilda and St. Beef. Um, do you think that your approach and your culture is something that can be applied to sort of all types of businesses? Or do you think that there are some which, by their very nature, just have to be driven by profits, like you know, their finance or certain, some of the certain tech giants and, and things like that? Um, I don't see why it can't be done anyway. I mean, we have a number of people from the NHS who come to our business to try and copy ideas of what they can do in the NHS. Uh, my dad has just become, gone on the board of Barclays and they are all over our business working out what they can take from our culture to implement into Barclays. Um, I think government is very difficult. The way government is run is completely the reverse of upside down management. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, you couldn't get a more, you know, I do a lot of stuff with the Ministry of Justice and uh, I just cannot believe how, how, how their culture operates. I can't believe anything actually gets done. <laughs> uh, but I don't see any reason why a culture of kindness, a culture of looking after your people, um, and a culture of trusting people to do a good job, it, it isn't possible to work anywhere. I mean, if you were to look at the way the army operates, um, actually a lot of that is upside down management. They're trusting the soldiers on the front line to make decisions and um, to do what they think is right in these difficult situations. So I think there will be, where, where you have banks, I think banks are the biggest issue because they're so over, overly regulated. And I was talking to an economist last week and we were talking about when the next recession is due because there will be another one. And he says he's not sure, maybe it's, maybe it's seven years, maybe it's eight years, maybe nine years, but he's pretty sure why it's going to happen. You know, because we've had the banking crisis before, we've had the oil crisis and so on. He says the next recession will be caused by over-regulation because the banks will not want to borrow money, will not want to lend money to people because they're in fear of breaking all their um, FSA guidelines. So I just think if you trust people to make the right decisions, if you look at the banks that are doing well, Metro Bank, Handelsbank, and where, where they actually trust the old fashioned bank manager to make lending decisions, they're the ones that had no impact on their business throughout the recession and so on. Okay. Okay, just one um, with the upside down management system, what's actually left for the managers to do? <laughs> Good question. What's their job to do is to serve customers and put money in the till. I mean, really, sorry, what's left for the managers to do? The, the lead, so the, oh, the, the, sorry, we have a shop manager, okay, so do you mean the, the area managers and stuff? Yeah. Their job is to make sure that their colleagues are happy. So our area managers look after a business that say turns over about five million pounds a year and they employ 80, 90 people. And it's their job is not to, we don't, we don't judge them on turnover, we don't judge them on profit, we don't judge them on margins, we don't judge them on customer complaints, we judge them on a very simple thing which is called the happy index, which is a bit like an attitude survey. Now you may have filled out attitude surveys, various things, hundreds of questions, yep. ours is one question. On a scale of one to ten, how happy are you with your area manager? And if you want space to write a comment, you can write a comment. In fact, I've got them all in our office at the moment. I've got to, we've got to go through them all. And that is how we judge how successful an area manager is. So to give you an idea, last year, four of our area managers, every one of their colleagues, gave them a 10 out of 10. Because it's their job to inspire them, to help them, and to make sure that this is the best job they've ever had. So that's what they do. They just go around making sure people are happy and doing what we can to inspire them. No budgets. What would, they, what would you identify as the flaws of our identity, management system, or are there not? Like in every business, you know, I, I spend my whole life fixing things. Um, that's the nature of leadership, isn't it? You're coming up with ideas, and then you've got to fix everything to try and get the idea into reality. The problem, the, the problem happens is when 
someone, something, in, something in someone's life goes wrong and they aren't confident or brave enough to come and talk to someone. So it could be a health problem, it could be a relationship problem, a money problem. It's normally one of those three things. And they either start stealing money from the till, the till never goes down because they're worried about that you know, work is not the most important place for them. Um, and that is the flaw in the system because we need to be helping them quicker um, than we are. But it's then you, you, know, you wouldn't get many businesses saying that that, would, that 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 was the problem, but for us, that is our one issue. You can see a shop's turnover, steady, 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 and then just fall off the cliff. And nothing's changed, it's just something in, in the life outside work of the, of the colleague who works there has changed. And that can happen to all of us, and it will happen to all of you at different times, it's how you cope with it and how you get the support around you to get yourself back up. Um, I've just got one question about you mentioned about generous and also in about happiness for your colleagues. But what I've been thinking about, like in the future, if you see any kind of improvement for uh, the number of your colleagues, do you think uh, this kind of like because uh, most colleagues have their own personalities and they seek to find to help them find their own personality and happiness? Do you think this kind of uh, would lead to a more diverse, maybe some misleading with your uh, like? Okay, so I don't want diverse personalities in my business. I want diverse cultures. I want diverse genders. I want um, diverse ages. I don't want any dissipation of our intense culture. Okay, but do you think like with the, the numbers growing, so maybe they might some of them then might not be able to to, to or to like this like idea won't be able to deliver to everybody in the correct version and they might lead to, to add up their own colour, to add up them their own personalities to it and they might deliver the wrong message to their customers. Sometimes we recruit the wrong people. Sometimes we buy businesses filled with people who are not the right personalities for us. Um, and that's why I spend two, three days a week going around the shops myself, meeting everybody and working out where the, where the problems are. I completely, you know, if I was to, the, the most important that, job in our, in our company is an area manager. So they, you know, they, employ four, they have 40 shops, 80 colleagues. If I get the wrong personality doing the area manager's job, everything goes wrong because they recruit people who are like themselves, their personalities aren't right and so on. Um, and that's why we really hate bringing anybody in from outside the business into any senior roles at all. So everyone's promoted from within so they get the culture. So that's my biggest fear, whenever we grow. So so we've doubled the size of the business in the last five years. We've, we've opened a thousand shops in the last four and a half years at a time when retail's gone down. And we've had to take on loads of people. Uh, we've bought businesses where people come in at quite senior roles, some you know, big salaries. And most of the time they go um, because I don't think that their personality fits. They're very nice people, they work really hard, but their personality doesn't fit. Okay, okay one more question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. So, um, is this Chatham House rules? Um, you are being filmed. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay let me phrase that. To, I was gonna, I'll answer the question the same way, but I'll use different, a different way of answering it. <laughs> when I meet senior members of the judiciary, they completely get what the argument is, which is there are some very bad people who need to go to prison for a long time, but there are a number of people who fail society, but also society has failed them. And it's our duty as a society to try and help them, but they need to do that whilst they're being um, in prison without their liberty. So I would say that the senior um, justice world doesn't want to send people to prison for too long and doesn't want to send people to prison for crimes that aren't worthy of a proper prison sentence. But they recognise that these people need, you know, their, their offending behaviour needs to be addressed. The problem is politicians, because the length of sentence that people have for various crimes only goes up because there are no votes in reducing stalking down to five years from 10 years. There's no, you know, if, if any of you are caught with a shotgun without a license, you'll, you'll go to prison for five years immediately. Doesn't matter what, if you've done nothing before. And that may probably go up to six years and then seven years. So the real problem is politicians and the Daily Mail. <laughs> because 
I, I've lost count of the number of times I've spoken to Secretaries of State for Justice, prison ministers, and they blame their policy, the, the lack of policy moves on the Daily Mail headlines, which I think is just madness. You know, these are elected people, they're, they're, they're not Paul Dacre. Is there any hope moving forward then think to try and just bring power away from that kind of politicians and media, I guess the tail wagging the dog? The, the biggest hope is the fact that the Treasury control far more of the government than any of us really understand. <laughs> <laughs> and if the Treasury won't give them the money, then they won't be able to lock up as many people. So one of, one of the things that I'm trying to do is to come up with strong arguments to reduce the prison population by, seven, say, 10,000. So let me give you just a few examples of that. You know, we have a number of prisoners over 90 years old. What's the point in having them in prison? We have a number of women going into prison for sentences of less than six weeks, complete waste of time. We have a number of people who on compassionate grounds should be released from prison. People with um, dementia, people with Parkinson's, people with um, undergoing chemotherapy. Um, we have a number of foreign nationals. Uh, we have a number of veterans we have, you know, so there are various ways you can cookie, salami slice the prison population. Um, but you can't get over the fact that there are lots of people there who should be there. And uh, there are lots of dangerous people who um, we as a society have a responsibility for when they're not just in prison, but when they've left. Because they're still a problem. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Can I ask the last question? Go on, go on. Oh, yeah. oh, I should have to say that very quickly. No, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, Hollywood College. Uh, hi, just wanted to ask that. Uh, so I basically, I believe that people respond to incentives. And if you just remove, like if you, if you, if you stress so much on removing custodial sentences, which at some point I absolutely completely agree with, some people should be released on compassionate grounds, and there's an absolute problem of, of, of overcrowding in prisons. But, but, but do you think, like, for, for some, some offenses, I think most offenses, I think I think penalty is is, is essential. It's, it's it's extremely important. So if not custodial sentence, could you could you um, perhaps like suggest like in your opinion what, what would, would be a better alternative, a better suited alternative to custodial sentences? Okay, so we lock up more people as a percentage of our population than any other country in the European Union. So there, are, so if you go to Norway, they they lock up about a quarter of the people that we lock up, but they still have lots of people committing crime. So those so there are lots of people not going to prison. So what do they do with them? It's home detention curfew. So for me, the key is using technology to monitor people um, so they can be at home, they can still read their kids' stories in bed, they can go to work, but they can't do anything else. So it's basically a tag. So you may, you, when, when the weather gets good, and we always used to abuse me, because tags just sort of got going when I was here at university. And you see some of the lads showing off their tag in the market square. But tagging is really important, and the way technology works now is very accurate, so they can really monitor um, what people are doing. But the other is, is community payback, and I think um, community payback has proven to be very successful when it's done well. Um, so there are lots of, re lots of ways of managing people outside prison, which means that they are far more employable, um, they can keep their families together, and they're less of a burden on the state. Fantastic. Thank you, James. That's uh, fantastic. One more final round of 